Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. I'm here with my cousin, Michael. We're in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And I've actually been wanting to do this interview for a long time, Michael. I'm not sure if you knew that. I didn't know that. I, I, I'm really enjoying talking to you about this particular topic, the uh, discipleship of the mind, and what does that look like. So can you introduce yourself and tell us some about your intellectual pursuits uh, currently? Yeah, so I was born in Virginia. Now I live in Lancaster. Never thought I would end up here. <laughs> uh, counselor at Life Ministry, so counseling is what I do. Um, so right now, that's primarily where the intellectual um, endeavors are, is, is mm -hmm. counseling related. Uh, that's what I have my degree in. There was an earlier phase of life where I was really passionate about academic theology. Mm. Probably too passionate, which is probably what we'll talk about oh, really? some okay. today. Probably most of what I'll say today has to do with that, my experiences with academic mm. theology. I think mm. that's where I learned a lot about um, the joys and pitfalls of mm. the life of the mind. Well, yeah, let's, I mean, let's jump right into that. Like, the life of the mind. What are some of the good sides of that? Like, how did you experience that as a, a positive thing mm. for your walk mm. as, a, as a believer? Well, so many things. So I think of language, um, hmm. not in the sense of English, Russian, Spanish, but in the sense of you know, we speak different languages, as it were. We use different terminology, different concepts, different ways of expressing the faith. Um, so one of the things about about intellectual pursuits is it can enrich your faith language. It can enrich your language for articulating the things of God. So I found that when I started studying academic theology, I could, I could talk to God and about God in ways that I couldn't before. Mm. It wasn't necessarily about the content. It wasn't necessarily about this idea. This, it was, it was more, more means of expression. And, and I think yeah. some people tend to think that you know, being an intellectual is somehow divorced from the heart, which I think is a misnomer anyway. I think we, that's an Americanized way of using the word heart uh, in emotional terms. But, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, the intellect and, and the emotional life are deeply interconnected in my experience. So that's one way that the life of the mind can really enrich, you know, one's spiritual life. Hmm. It's almost like... Um an expanding of of your world almost yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. giving you more yeah. ways of explaining things almost mm -hmm, like mm -hmm, another way of thinking mm -hmm. but in a devotional mm -hmm. sense too yeah um, um, in in prayer so I don't you know share all of what goes on up here with just everybody um, but you can share it with God if it's opaque to human beings it's not opaque to God so in counseling, uh, we, if, can I expand on that? Yeah, yeah, In please, counseling, yeah. we're always talking about content and process. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the things I thought about in preparation for this interview. I think it's mm -hmm. easy to judge the merits of intellectual, you know, whether it's theology or any other intellectual pursuit, simply based on the content. But the process is valuable as well. So, you know, there are a number of things, you know, if you're an intellectual type and you like to learn, you like to think, it might be easy to, to think, well, this thing that I'm studying, this thing that I'm reading about, what does it really matter? What does this subject really, yeah. you know? That's not the only element, the process of learning, the process mm -hmm. of cogitating, the process of, mm -hmm. of thinking can be enriching. It can be a replenishment of psychological energy that then used to, to bless others. Okay, this is wild. Like, I've never thought of it quite like that before. I, this is way off the beaten trail, but like for me personally, I wasn't even thinking of this when I wrote the questions for this interview, mm -hmm. but I find that I'm a little bit off in life if I don't spend some time every day, usually in the morning, just letting my brain work on something <laughs> or to learn, just learn yes, something. Yes, yes, I'm, you know? I'm with okay, you. Okay, so I'm, I'm not weird in that, I guess. Well, unless we both are, and, and, and maybe. But, but like that comes back to that process and how that can bring, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, well, I think you like say it's psychological renewal or like mental rejuvenation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for me, it, it could be just a, anything even, like teaching myself a new thing about whatever, yeah. math or philosophy, or exactly. not even necessarily exactly. spiritual. Whoa, okay, yeah. I've, I've just, I've never thought of it that way. I was, and I've just been noticing that about myself. 
You know, and the same thing is true with just the basics of the faith of the Bible. So, you know, some people kind of have the attitude, well, why do we come to church week after week after week? I mean, after 50 years of church attendance, don't we know the Bible? Don't we know, <laughs> you know, that God loves us and everything? But maybe it's not about accumulating knowledge. And the knowledge matters because it provides yeah. a framework. But it's the process of coming together and worshiping God by, by receiving his word. Um, yeah. The same way that you know a tree needs water all its life, it never mm -hmm. accumulates X amount of water, and now it's watered. So you're describing how, you know, the intellectual pursuits that discipleship of the mind is helpful and rejuvenating, and it wasn't for you, and, and how that works. Talk about, and you hinted at this before, but some of the negatives. Mm. Um, mm. You know, there, there's always a ditch on both sides. Mm. So what are some things you learned through this in mm. the past that? that you would like to share? Yeah, honestly, most of my thoughts in preparation for this were about the negative. Must, oh no, must okay. Be honest. Well, th that process thing is true there as well. If intellect is, is um, engaged for its own sake, if the life of the mind takes on a life of its own, um, then it's easy to get into a process that detracts, I think, from, mm. from having the posture of a disciple. So if we think about what is the posture of a disciple, to me, the, the image for that is Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, that's, a, that's not an anti-intellectual image. I mean, she's, she's learning. She's, I mean, she gets scolded, after all, by her sister for not being in the kitchen doing practical stuff when she's, she's out there with the men. Uh, so it's not an anti-intellectual image, but, but it's a beautiful kind of archetype for the posture of a disciple, which is receptive, pliant, submissive, uh, we're receiving from God. We're, we're putting ourselves at his feet. Sometimes we call it brokenness. Sometimes we call it surrender. Um, when the intellect is overindulged, especially in certain ways, I think we can lose the capacity for being in that posture. So being an intellect, an intellectual or a learner, it can mean, you know, learning, learning new things, being stretched, but it can mean I'm dissecting, I'm evaluating, I'm judging, I'm deciding what's true about the universe. Again, the content may be great, may be really good theology, it may be a really important issue, um, and that's all well and good, but what's the process? Mm -hmm. What posture am I in? And I think in my own life, that's been one of my regrets, is just spending too much time in that place where I'm the authority, making myself the authority. Oh, wow, yeah. Um, by trying to constantly, you know, figure things out. And I mean, some of that just comes down to overthinking isn't a good idea, <laughs> uh, but that's uh -huh. the theology of it. So is it, it, it I'm, I'm assuming humility plays a huge part in this, right? Because you were talking about how you're working through all this stuff, dissecting, making judgments on what mm -hmm. is true. Mm -hmm. Doesn't strike me as the most humble way to go about no, it, right? No. Yeah. So then what's the intersection between the good aspects we were discussing of the intellectual life and then mm. taking that, okay, but then marrying it to di real discipleship? Mm. What does that mm. actually look like? The question itself is so important because, Ooh, yeah. you know, believers who uh, have a large intellectual appetite in my experience, uh, tend to say things like this. Well, we're to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and that's, that's great. It's great to point that out. It's often ignored. We often miss that part of the command. But the question I so seldom hear asked is, well, how do you do that? What makes it loving God with my mind, as opposed to just vegging out on intellectual uh, yeah. uh, indulgence? Um, so just asking the question, I think, uh, for starters. Yeah, honestly, I don't know that I have a whole lot of really practical thoughts there. I think it's mostly about an attitude. So I think about three things. I think about worship, discipleship, and fellowship. How does my engagement of the life of the mind impact me in those three ways? Maybe not letting it be the thing itself. End in itself. Yeah, yeah. But a means to an end. Yeah. Well, so the question I'd have then, what did it look like for you? When you came to that place mm. where you're like, ooh, I'm out of balance here. Mm. How did you mm. try to get yourself back into, into balance? A long and tortuous process. <laughs> 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 and maybe it's still going on. I, I think some of it was tapping into very different uh, expressions of the faith that are much simpler. 
Um, mm -hmm. So for me, uh, music was really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. So I remember during one time when um, there was a lot of uh, confusion for me because part of, mm. part of studying academic theology is getting a lot of stuff in your head and sometimes that can create you know, confusion, fragmentation even. I remember listening to two albums, um, The Nathan Good Family, I forget the name of the album, uh -huh. and Oasis Chorale, Hymns of the Church, Volume 1. Oh, okay. And yeah. I just listened to those over and over and over and experience so much healing because mm -hmm. this music is timeless you know these hymns and gospel songs um, could could somehow speak at a level that was underneath all of the the intellectual detritus uh, that that was that was up here cuts through the noise almost C yeah 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 yeah, that's right. Mm. I, I think a lot of it, though, is is living in community. It's it's asking different questions. Mm -hmm. So so I used to ask this question. It's kind of embarrassing to look back on this time in my life now because it's such a, a selfish focus. But I was asking the question: Well, where can I find people who share my interests? Honestly, that can be difficult because being intellectually inclined isn't necessarily a unifying experience like it once was because of the diversification of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, but I tried to start asking a different question. How can I connect with the people who are right here, right now, with me? How do I, how do I love and serve mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the people that I'm with, whether they share these intellectual interests or whether they don't? Um, and I've, I'm finding that uh, that kind of fellowship is maybe just as satisfying, maybe even more satisfying. Don't feel like I have a lot of practical answers here. With no, this, this is, uh, yeah. no, I, I like this though, like describing your process. Mm -hmm. Going back to that concept, the process mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, yeah I've, just, I've never thought about it quite like that mm -hmm. before. I think too about, about integration, so everything is text. So you can, you can oh, yeah. learn from everything. And so this is on more of the positive side of it. So just asking the question, well, what can I learn from this? So if I'm, if I'm reading a book on whatever subject, mm -hmm. um, what can I learn from this? Because I guarantee it teaches something important if you listen about God, about the human condition, about the wonder of, of mm -hmm. the world. So looping this all back around here, how can those who are those of us in their church, you know, especially we're thinking Anabaptist church, that are more intellectually inclined, more academically inclined, how can we learn to integrate well with mm. our local churches, mm. um, with our brothers and sisters who, who may not, who may be very content doing much more hands-on type mm. things. Mm -hmm. Personally, I've, I've witnessed this as a, a real challenge for some churches because mm -hmm. you, you just have such a variety. You may have one person who teaches a college class for a living and the person next pew over is a farmer or a carpenter mm -hmm. or a, you know, mm -hmm. something very hands-on. How do we integrate these two things? Mm -hmm. How can we love each other through this? Excellent. And that's, uh, that is the question. Um, because, because that's what the church is for. Mm. That's, yeah. the, you know, I think we tend to have this, uh, and this is getting away from the how question again, mm. but... I think we tend to sometimes have this attitude that our external differences are, are these aggravating impediments to the kind of commonality that, that we want to have. Um, I think it's the point of church. I think that the diversity mm -hmm. in external things together with the unity in our faith in Jesus Christ is the point, or, or, rather, or rather the opportunity to love and serve each other in the midst of that is mm -hmm. the point. This is one of the things we have to be careful about in our in our plain churches, uh, is that is that we don't uh, make cultural uniformity in in extra biblical things um, the the measure and standard because that actually goes against the grain mm. of and I say that as someone who loves plain culture mm -hmm. it actually goes against the grain of New Testament ecclesiology. But the how question, yeah, the how question. So again, I come back to attitude. Um, mm. Care about the essentials. Value the essentials. Invest in the essentials because that's what we have in common, mm. hopefully. That's where I think the purely private investments we make in the intellectual life, if, if it means, it's one thing if, it's, if it enriches 
um, my fellowship, my worship, my discipleship. When it becomes the thing that I primary, primarily value, that's going to detract from fellowship. That's going to get in the way of fellowship. So I think of something Don Carson said. I don't agree with Don Carson on everything, but he said we have this tendency to merely assume the gospel and then our passion is in everything else. Maybe good things, but things that are maybe more peripheral, more in the realm of maybe application, if you want to say. If we're passionate about the gospel, then I think we are naturally going to connect more with our brothers and sisters and, and to make discipleship the, the priority. So, so the dominant question is, how do I love and serve the people that I'm with? That's, that still doesn't answer the, the practical <laughs> question, does it? Uh, I mean, I, I think it's, just, it's as simple as if, if my brother is a mechanic, then I'll ask questions about mechanic work. Mm. I'll take an interest in whatever is, what's his life about? Because mm. that's what I would want. That's what those of us who are intellectually inclined, probably a lot of us wish mm. for that <laughs> and feel lonely yeah. in that. Yeah. But it's an opportunity to, to turn it around and practice um, the golden rule, you know. That's mm. what I would want done to me. I can use that as a springboard for, for doing it to, to someone else. Because I think isn't that some of the challenge for those that have more intellectual type jobs or, or you know, are in college or whatever in our planned circles in Anabaptist culture, that's not as usual, mm. you know? And, yeah. I, and I think yeah. maybe that can feel lonely. It does, yeah. it does. That's the other question, how do we, I mean, what do they need? How do we disciple people? How do you disciple someone who's smarter than you are? <laughs> in some ways, maybe he's not sure. mechanically smart, or maybe there's some other yeah. way. But, but how do you disciple someone who knows more than you do, mm. who's been to seminary and you haven't, but you're kind of, you know, because of age or because of whatever, mm-hmm. you're that person's, uh, you're in a leadership or a position of influence. I, I, think, I think that sometimes it's easy to be intimidated by intellectuals. Could that be some of the challenge, maybe them missing each other in the communication because we're, mm-hmm. we're not mm-hmm. scared, but like. Or maybe. Well, I mean, yeah, maybe scared, but more like, I mean, oh, well, we're just, we don't know what that's like. We don't understand it. So we're just kind of not really go there as much. It's awkward. It's, it's challenging. Sometimes you've got two people who are intimidated. So I, I remember, oh, okay. I remember mm-hmm. confessing to someone one time, you know, when people ask me, this was back when I was in college, when people asked me what I, about that, mm. I, without thinking, I hang my head. And, uh, and she said, well, they're probably doing the same thing. I think intellectuals don't need the people in their lives to be intimidated by them. Mm-hmm. You know, they need to be loved just like everyone else. That's the last question I had written down, but is there anything else you would like to share? Well, I, I thought about this, um, thinking ahead to the end of life. How do I want to be remembered? And I thought about this different times, and honestly, it's troubled me. And I still think about it. Do I want to be remembered as, do I, do I want people to say, well, that guy was really smart? Or do I want people to say, he loved God, hmm. and he loved people? And that's the question I think uh, we who are more intellectually inclined ought to grapple with. That's powerful. I think we should leave our audience to think about that. I thought that might make a good final observation. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing, Michael. This no, you're been, welcome. This has been very uh, informative for me. I really appreciate it. Yes, I've enjoyed it too. Mm-hmm.